Hi, Tanil, and welcome to the show. It's great to have you on here today. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's such a pleasure to be able to chat with you today. We only just recently got introduced, probably just a couple months back. We'll be getting into kind of your overall health story, and you've lived a pretty amazing and I would say adventurous, exciting life. And so I wanted to go over uh, really how you started to get into the wrestling, uh, we'll call it entertainment-based industry, and would love to hear basically how you describe the work that you do, since I know that you are um, in demand as a wrestler right now, but you do so much more too. So what's kind of, um, well, give us a, not, not quite background yet, but what it is that you do on essentially uh, a daily, weekly basis for your career. Yeah, it's, it's a little different, a little different career choice, but, um, so basic, so I'm a professional wrestler, um, and I've wrestled since I can remember, basically. Um, I do shows in arenas all around the world, typically. Um, not right now, obviously. But yeah, I travel for a living and um, perform. And it's basically a form of entertainment, like you said, but mixed with um, a sport, obviously. So sports entertainment, basically. Yeah, and we go on and put out a show in front of fans, um, you know, with the, the music and the entrance and, um, yeah, years and years of training to put together matches. And, um, and that is on TV and across the internet and uh, worldwide for fans to watch. Yeah, and a lot of people I think are most familiar. I mean, when I grew up, I was watching WWF wrestling. Now it's called WWE, probably the last decade or so, more than that now. Um, but it, it is now such a show. Like, it's so well done, it's unbelievable. Meaning, like, it was good back when I was a kid. I, I really enjoyed it, loved it. But now, if I flip it on, I mean, it is, like you just said, the camera work, the storylines, and also the athletic ability of all of the wrestlers is now 10x what it used to be. And I know that has to do with training, that has to do with nutrition, but I would also say recovery, you know, as well. And I want to get into that too, kind of what what it takes to be able to put your body through that. Um, I think a lot of people can see the actual effort and being thrown around, all that does in the body, but what they probably don't know about is all the travel that goes on into it too. So being able to balance that, I mean, must be, must be pretty uh, intense, but before we get to that, I'd love to hear, how did you get into the, uh, well, I'm just going to call it, you know, the wild world of wrestling uh, from the beginning. Like you knew from a really young age, I think I was reading your bio and it said somewhere around like 14 years old or so, maybe even younger. Yes. Yeah, so I first started, uh, I just loved wrestling since I was a little, about eight years old. I fell in love with it. My brother watched on TV with me and by the time I was about 11 or 12 years old, I was like begging my mom, like, I want to be a wrestler. Take me somewhere to, so I can learn to be a wrestler anyway. So she held off a few years and eventually around 13 or 14, I happened to see a sign for a local show and was just like, I need to go and see if they can train me. And that was, that was kind of it. So, um, I started training around 14 and, you know, finished my schooling and kept training throughout the schooling. And then I went to university for a year and just thought, you know, I could do this, but it's just doesn't feel right. Like it's not for me. So I thought, you know, why don't I just go out on a whim and try this whole <laughs> wrestling craziness. And so I moved myself to Canada to train with a the professional there, Lance Storm. And that's kind of where it, it all kind of, started piecing together finally, because obviously Australia, um, is quite far away from where, you know, the wrestling hub in uh, America and Canada was quite known for it as well. So I started by training with Landstorm there when I was 19, I moved to Canada by myself. Wow. And from there, um, I just basically trained as much as I could started to learn finally about my health and nutrition, how much of a, a role that played in wanting to be a professional. Um, and then also, um, started to network and travel doing shows for independent companies throughout the country. And yeah, eventually I got, uh, an, an opportunity to go to an open tryout with WWE. Um, and I was one of the basically the lucky person that was offered the contract at the end out of everyone that went, um, they offered me the contract. So that's how that whole started, um, with WWE. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's absolutely incredible. And I mean, you were the, you were the first Aussie female wrestler in the WWE, which is, uh, first of all, you were so far ahead of the curve. I mean, how did you know at 
eight years old when there wasn't even a lot of female wrestling going on. You're like, I want to do that. I want to basically enter a male dominated sport and be a female that's going to be rise to the top because now we know female uh, wrestling is, is absolutely huge. And there's all sorts of spinoff reality shows and TV shows, but you were interested before any of that even happened. Yeah, it's kind of crazy, actually, now that I when, I, when people say it like that to me, yes, but growing up, I was definitely a bit of a tomboy, and, um, you know, I definitely can get dressed up and with all the hair and makeup when I need to for the shows, but I, but normally I'm a very kind of chilled, laid back, um, outdoorsy kind of person, so I, I definitely was a tomboy and, and loved the whole kind of entertainment aspect of it, the, the the gritty part of it, you know, um, was definitely drawn in by like Stone Cold Steve Austin was my favorites. And he was just a, a badass, you know, that liked to kick asses. So all of that kind of drew me in and, and yeah, I just never really thought about the fact of that there wasn't a lot of females doing it, I guess. I just thought, why can't I do this? And, and that was it. There was never, a, Oh, is this for me? It was, I was just kind of, this is it. One track mind. Uh, absolutely. I mean, did you play a lot of sports growing up as well? Were you always athletic? Yeah, I definitely played all kinds of sports, tried everything out that there was to, to play really. And I, and I loved playing sports. Um, but yeah, wrestling was the one thing that I stuck to. And then what was it like when you essentially just packed up? Uh, had you traveled a lot before that to other parts of the world before 19 years old? You just said, OK, I'm going to I'm going to move to Canada. I actually really hadn't traveled um, before that, maybe one one trip or so, but um, nothing like that. And I guess I just knew that for me to make it a profession and to be serious about it, I had to do something big. I had to make a decision and put myself out there um, and kind of take a risk. And so that was what it was. And I knew that I would get the professional training that would be that foundation for me to build upon. And being in Australia, I was never going to reach that. So I had to do something and move myself overseas to start that journey. And so for me, I was just like, I'm just going to try it. I mean, a lot of people don't know that, but it's like, you just can't just say, okay, I want to go try out. Like you need the training. You need to know how to, um, hold yourself in the ring and also not injure the person that you are going to be competing against. Uh, you also need to know all the different cues. Like, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it is a full school that you need to go through, right? I mean, it was probably a couple of years before you started to wrestle professionally. Uh, it's rigor, rigorous training. Um, people don't necessarily realize that, you know, a lot of people kind of joke around about wrestling and like the punches and, you know, but there, and I totally get it, but there is so much like uh, years and years. I, like I said, I started when I was 14 and I'm 31 now. So, and when I first got my contract, I think I was 22. So that just goes to show how many years of training and traveling and working for independent companies and building my resume. Um, that, that's how long it took. And as, as well as learning different crafts from different trainers, um, working with different people in the ring, because it, it is a much of a, like I said, there's storylines involved, there's cues, there's time cues you have to hit. There's um, a method to um, working with your the partner in the ring to create that kind of entertainment and show. So there's so much more that goes into it. Um, working on promotional skills, talking with media interviews, um, you know, conversing in front of a camera, working in front of a live crowd. It's just a million things that go into it. People have no idea about. So when you left Australia, well, where, where in Australia did you live before you'd left? I grew up in Melbourne. In Melbourne. Okay. I didn't make it down there. I was in Sydney and I was in, uh, Noosa and a few other spots when, um, I was just there. Uh, well now it's, now it's going back about eight months or so, but it was absolutely amazing. It, no, that's exactly right. Like I literally was, it was last trip in, last trip out. The airport was desolate, um, you know, when I was leaving and we actually had to cancel our trip a week early. Um, and which, which was too bad because we absolutely loved being up near, uh, what's it? The Sunshine Coast, Noosa and yeah, yeah. Oh, Byron Bay. We miss Byron Bay. We were really looking forward to going. Um, but we'll be back, you know, once all of this settles out and, you know, I'm looking forward to that since I really love, well, I love Australia, but I also love the people there. It's, it's just different. So what was it like when you left Australia? And, and again, Melbourne's a decent sized city, so it's not like you're, you know, moving from a small place, but what was it like kind of leaving everything, uprooting and just saying, okay, you know, I'm going to head out uh, to Canada and then eventually the U.S.? I guess for me, it was just exciting. Um, and I guess from, from that point of view, Australians are, are very, you know, laid back, chill kind of people. And, um, it's a beautiful country, but we also grew up watching a lot of American TV. 
Um, so for me, it was kind of like I was a little familiar with it from that point of view. Um, and there was just my, my sister, I remember she traveled when she was in school and went to America and I was always so jealous that she got to go and I never did. So it was just kind of always a dream for me to go out, go to America and to travel. And, um, and I love the wrestling obviously. So that kind of linked in, but yeah, it's just, was just something I was always excited to be able to do. That's fantastic. And then, um, when you get that big break, when you get that call from WWE to basically make it on the biggest platform, you know, in entertainment and TV, uh, what was that like? I mean, was that just a relief? Did you expect it? Did you, what, what was that like? I guess I never expected it. Uh, you never really envision it actually happening. Um, and it wasn't even a call. It was actually in person where I was offered my contract. So, mm. I um, literally can remember the moment to a T and I don't have the best memory, <laughs> but my heart was absolutely pounding. Um, I was surrounded by all the people at my tryout. It was like a, a week long tryout with um, everything from cardio and drills to promos to anything and everything you can think of. And it, it was a draining full on week. And I remember um, just at the end thinking, this is it. Like now we find out what happens next. And I never really thought that it would actually happen. So when they read out my name, I, li I just remember I literally just like my head in my hands, like just bawling, like happy tears, but just in disbelief. Um, and yeah, I guess when it's, when there's something you love that much and you want that badly and for it to finally happen, it's just a surreal feeling. And it's, and it still is when I think back on my career and my journey so far. Yeah. And I know that you've battled a, a couple shoulder injuries and, and issues to that extent. I would love to hear, you know, just to keep yourself in shape, uh, while traveling, what's, what's an average month like? Like how many days are on the road? How many day or how many hours of a day are rehearsing? Uh, are there any days off? Uh, what, what is that like for your average or your professional wrestler? I should say. Yeah. So um, on a normal schedule, so for instance, when I was with WWE, um, the schedule is very intense. Um, so we would normally, for instance, do a loop of live events um, from anywhere from, say, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, um, or Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then do a live TV once or twice a week, two following that. So it could be up to four days or five days a week where you're taping, um, doing either live shows or taping a TV or a live TV. And obviously the travel on either end of that too. So there's, you fly in and you fly out. That's why it was called a loop. And in between that you'd travel, um, using a rental car or a, sometimes a tour bus if we were on tour between the cities and drive from one to the other. So it literally could be all day at TVs from, you know, 12 o'clock in the afternoon till midnight and taping, filming things, um, working out the matches and your training and then getting in a car or driving three hours to the next city trying to sleep a little bit, get up, go to the gym, go back to TV, do the same thing all over again. So it can be as rigorous as that. Um, and obviously when we're on overseas tours, uh, those almost took weeks to recover from because you could literally be getting off a plane, going straight to an arena, trying to find a local gym, going to perform and then getting back on some sort of transport right after that. Mm. So your, I mean, your body has to be it's It takes its shape. toll. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, you do. You have to. It was always a priority to um, put my health obviously first and try find a local gym or, and try to eat the right things while you're traveling because it's so hard to find good things to eat, especially when you're doing late night drives or on planes all the time. Sure. Was there any recovery, like let's just say 10 years ago, maybe even 15, was there any recovery built in for the wrestlers or is that and maybe it's not even a new thing, but are, are people doing it now? And were they doing it 10 years ago? Massage and sauna and that type of thing? I would say it's definitely more common in the later, in the, more recently. Um, and maybe even just for me particularly, but um, the last few years have been very eye-opening into how much or how important it is to do the recovery part of, of all this. And I definitely took it for granted for a long time. Um, I think maybe because I was younger and just felt a bit... Um, you know, invincible at times. So I kind of just pushed on, but, uh, these days recovery is such a huge part of it. And there definitely is, I mean, I myself do, um, a lot of your, um, you know, things that you recommend like the sauna and the dry brushing and, um, I do yoga and, and all my workouts as well, massage, um, all of the chiropractic, you know, regular things that I incorporate now, um, into my lifestyle, but, um, definitely over the years, I 
didn't do as much as I should have. <laughs> and does um, a company like Impact or WWE or one of these um, NXT, do they bring chiropractors, massage therapists for the wrestlers? Or is that something you just do on your own? You have to do on your own. Yeah, um, they do, especially on tours or live shows. They usually have a doctor there. Um, they usually have a chiropractor and a, and a masseuse, masseuse as well. So um, those are all accessible to the wrestlers. Um, I mean, there could be anything and everything can happen uh, at a wrestling show. So um, there needs to be people on hand to help recover. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the thing too, whenever there's that much impact or jumping, you know, 10 feet up in the air, uh, the body's just not necessarily designed for that. So it's good to have, you know, a lot of those professionals on hand. So that, that's great to hear. And then of course, just traveling with a, a good foam roller, massage ball, uh, all of those things can be, I'm, I'm sure, super helpful. All so, things in the last few years, I make sure to pack now. <laughs> good. And uh, I mean, that's the thing too, is like, you know, you're then hopefully teaching then people, in their early 20s, be like, I know you're not feeling it now, but if you want a long career, this is what to start doing now. Uh, because uh, I feel like people told me that too, and I just didn't listen. But now I 100, 100% look back and go, oh, maybe I should have done some of those things. So Well, it's, it's hard to listen to your tip. 20s. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's that 20s are a different different stage. It's almost like you have to go through it. You have to not do it to know that you need to do it. And so <laughs> and it's okay. I, I, I totally understand. Um, are you looking forward to many more years in wrestling? Is that is that what you see ahead for yourself? Yeah, I definitely have a lot more I want to accomplish in the wrestling world. And it has led me to, it's opened a lot of doorways for me outside of wrestling as well. So I love that. Um, but I also would love to have a family one day and, um, you know, live a somewhat normal life, which is not necessarily doesn't go hand in hand with the wrestling. So I think when it's my time to be done, I'll know, but it, it also feels like I'll never be able to step away from the wrestling because it's, it's just, it's almost like an addiction at that point. You just, I just love it so much, you know? So yeah. definitely have at least a few more years, I would say. That's great to hear. And, and you're also independent right now, I believe. So you're not under contract. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe I didn't do my research well enough. I actually am. I'm under contract while within North America with uh, Impact Wrestling. Okay. And, and then I can still do international shows and tours um, when that's possible as well. Got it. Okay. So you're still under contract uh, with one organization. I didn't know if you're able to kind of pick and choose when you'd be wrestling, what times of the year to go through, you know, whether it's uh, training. Um, and uh, internationally, I can, I can okay. pick and choose. Yeah. But when it's um, within the America or North America, um, I am exclusive with them. And are they, do they travel all around as well? Is that all over the US and Canada? They do normally travel, whereas right now it's um, just just kind of one spot where they're doing the TV tapings because of obviously COVID and everything that's going on. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I actually remember them, like any other sport, basically doing it not with a live audience. How has that been, taping, going through your storylines, all that without the audience participation? Yeah, it's definitely very different um, because... The crowds is one of the most exciting parts of it for starters um, and being able to play off that crowd and get the reactions you want, whether it's them booing you or cheering you. Um, it kind of helps to dictate the match and the flow of things as well when you just kind of play off that. Uh, so you kind of have to just almost change your mindset and just be kind of in the zone and um, which I do pretty well. I, I can kind of just be oblivious to what's going on around me and, and zone into my character. Um, so I actually don't mind it, but it's, it's definitely, uh, missing that excitement where I, you know, you can see the live audience, like, and their reactions and, and that, that fun aspect of it. Is there a lot of improv during the match? Like, is there natural, um, like uh, I, I thought it was more, you have your storyline and you're sticking to that. And you know, you, you know, you, you might know, know the outcome ahead of time, but is there a lot more improv than people think? Yeah, I would say there is, um, there's definitely, it's predetermined. So, you know, the outcome and you know, the storyline of what you're trying to kind of get across to the audience, but it, it really depends on the situation and even sometimes who your opponent is and how experienced they are. For instance, um, there's definitely times where, um, if you're in the ring with someone that you've wrestled many times, you know, them so well, where you can just improvise and you can say, Oh, um, and you, you actually speak to each other kind of in there. Well, subtly, but, um, yeah, you can improvise and, and they usually 
know by your mannerisms or what you're doing, even what might be coming next, or you'll kind of work it out as you go, but you know, the main points and you know, the finish. Sure. Well, when you said you play off of the crowd that, I mean, that led me to believe that there is then, you know, a little bit of uh, improv within the ring. And the reason why I asked that is that, you know, again, like you're, you're uh, very athletic individuals flying at each other at, you know, 10 miles an hour, uh, you know, collisions can happen that aren't necessarily a good thing. Uh, especially if you are kind of playing outside of the script, has that ever happened to you where you've, you've become injured? Yes. Um, I've had too many injuries. Um, but, but, um, it's wrestling, so, you know, accidents happen, but yeah, there's definitely times where things can be improvised or unexpected or there's misunderstandings, um, and collisions happen. Um, but obviously that's not <laughs> the planned part of it. So it happens. It happens. Exactly. Now, um, so you've had, you've had multiple injuries. I know that you've had multiple shoulder injuries, how have you learned from those, rehab from those, and, and is your body better because of it, or do you really have to watch out for those still to this day? Yeah, so I've had, I think, three surgeries on my shoulder now. I've had one on my back where I had a ruptured disc that um, herniated completely as touching my spinal cord, so that was fun. Um, so, yeah, definitely done all kinds of rehab over the years, Spent, had a lot of time off, uh, and it's definitely taught me to uh, pay more attention to – the recovery part of things like we're talking about um, and obviously all different techniques um, and, you know, even little things like band workouts and um, pr warming up before I do things and certain things like that, that I did take for granted before. Um, it's kind of, I come in, implement into like my everyday lifestyle now to kind of take care of that and make sure I don't have further injuries down the road. Yeah, hundred percent. And I know that um, one of the injuries coincided and it's public knowledge now, cause I would obviously never, uh, break confidentiality with anybody that we work with or talk with, but you actually took some time off just a couple of years ago, I believe because of an autoimmune issue involving psoriasis. And it was written into the storyline and that it was also kind of part of one of your injuries, which I think you actually were injured and you were just taking care of both at the same time. Is that correct? Yeah, so I actually did have a shoulder injury at that point, and I knew I was about to take time off. Um, it wasn't really part of the storyline, actually. That was more my doing. <laughs> um, I guess I knew that at that time I was struggling really bad with my psoriasis, and I was um, basically covered head to toe, but I was high hiding it at that point. So most people had no idea. Um, I was just kind of wearing a bit more covered um, outfits than my normal more revealing wrestling attire. Um, and obviously, you know, makeup can cover the face somewhat, but, um, people had no idea what was going on. And I just felt like it was time to kind of be open with the audience about what was really going on. Cause I was struggling really bad. Um, and I just felt like my whole body was just starting to shut down and it, with the injury as well, I just knew I was going to have time off and I needed to take time to, get myself better mentally and physically. So I decided to share that with everyone and kind of just say, you know, like, this is what's happening. I don't want to hide it anymore. And I want to talk about it because I know so many other people must be going through things like this that we don't hear about. Um, and it, I knew that it, I guess I was trying to think of it in a positive light where I knew I'd struggled with it for many years and there had been some good outcomes from it. And obviously I still was living my dream of being a professional wrestler. So I guess I just wanted to take the time to let people know that and let them in to my life. Um, but also say like, there's going to be a good outcome to this as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it, I, I think it's great that you are sharing it with people because sometimes we try to hide any things that we consider a flaw or anything that's, you know, doesn't put us up on that pedestal. But uh, I'm assuming the good that is going to come out of this and you being a role model for overcoming an autoimmune uh, based illness is going to be as powerful as, you know, your wrestling career for a lot of people. And, and a lot of other people will really come along for your ride uh, because they were dealing with psoriasis, found out about you. And, and now again, you're a role model for them, uh, especially doing and being in a career that demands so much of the body. And we're out there for the public to see. I mean, you're not wearing, you know, uh, head to toe outfits. You are there revealed. People can see your body uh, for better or worse. They're going to judge you. They're going to say this, they're going to say that. And you get to be a strong, you know, powerful woman for many, many other people out there. So I, I think it's great. I want to commend you on that. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. And I've been overwhelmed with the amount of messages and people that um, share their stories with me or say that they never knew I had this and just so many um, 
positive, uplifting things that we're all sharing with each other and the fan base to try help people get better. So like, it's been very rewarding for me too, actually. And how long have you been struggling with psoriasis? So I first started um, with an outbreak. I think I was about 15 or 16 when I first got it. Um, and it actually runs in my family. My dad has it as well, my brother a little bit, um, but no one to the extent that I have had it. Um, like I said, I've been covered literally head to toe um, a number of times. And they're more like this kind of, it's probably stress induced more so with, with something that triggers it at that point, I would say. But most of the time it is somewhat manageable um, and people wouldn't really know that I have it. When did you find your biggest flare ups? Was it one on the road, one lack of sleep? Like what was it for you that were the bigger triggers? My, my biggest trigger, well, I actually notice um, it's when I get start getting sick, like with like a throat, um, my, my glands. I notice my glands get swollen and, um, and then I feel very run down and then it's kind of all just happens really quickly after that. Um, so my biggest outbreak more recently was probably, actually it's probably almost two years ago now. And, and that's again when I was covered head to toe. At that point I was, I had just left WWE. I'd started doing the independent, Independent wrestling. I was traveling across the country, across the world and the country. Um, so you can definitely say it was stress as well. My body was just run down from traveling, you know, 24 hours of travel sometimes to get from the U S to Australia. I went to Germany and the UK and, and from going to place to place and wrestling for a, a show and then traveling, then wrestling again, then getting on a plane. I just wasn't really recovering. It's just kind of in that fight or flight mode that you mention all the time. So, um, I definitely think I was just surviving for a while and then all of a sudden it hit me and I got sick and I run down. I noticed I started to see spots of psoriasis. They start really little and then they kind of grow. And then I was just kind of covered before I knew it. And at that point it's almost, there's no quick fix for it. So I was like, okay, we're in for this again. And I got to you know, it's all the diet stuff. I know it's a hundred percent key. So back onto working out where I've gone off track and fixing it all again. Yeah. And, and we were just chatting just for a little bit and before this and yeah, diet is a hundred percent of it and stress is a hundred percent of it. So, you know, there's a big part to it and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the gut in a moment, but you know, that's, that's the thing. And, and that is what I, I speak about quite a bit. And I'm very happy that it's continue, that it's starting to catch on is that there's a genetic predisposition. You said, okay, your father uh, had it. Who knows who, who other people, uh, previous generations had it as well. Your brother has it a little bit. You have it a little bit. So, you know, that's, but you didn't have it until 15 years old, even though you have the genetics for it. And then there is the filling up of that rain barrel, right? And so we could talk a little bit about, you know, what you found. Uh, but then after that, there's a trigger event. And so, yes, you got sick, but you got sick because you were body was stressed because you were traveling all over the place. And what happens with um, your, uh, at least previous, uh, phase of the immune system was more Th1 dominant. So usually your immune system's pretty robust. Usually you're doing pretty well. And then all of a sudden though, you know, you push it too far and then you end up with a big outbreak of psoriasis, like you just said, and then it's not a couple days for it to go away or typically even a couple weeks. The whole body has to settle back down by empty the rain barrel. And that's not just with foods. That is with stress. That's with more sleep, more rest, all the things that are not conducive to uh, a great professional wrestling career. That's exactly it. And that's what I had to do last time was basically take some time off where I wasn't putting that stress on my body from all the, the workouts, the travel, um, and, you know, 100% focusing on my stress levels and my diet. And that's when I noticed everything started to calm down again. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to hear too, because they've done a lot of research in TH1, TH2 uh, mediated immune responses, uh, simply because I, I had a, a really terrible TH2 uh, mediated res, uh, immune response and it took me forever uh, to even find out what that was. But um, the interesting thing is that heavy weight training actually pushes uh, the immune system further out of balance. And so you need that because you have to keep your body in great shape. But when you're already in balance, believe it or not, it only makes it worse. Now, when you're healthy and you do a good workout, well, it's just a normal hermetic stressor. Your body breaks down a little bit and it gets stronger. But when your body's already broken down, that doing that extra workouts, and that used to affect me, uh, pushes you more towards that genetic predisposition. So that's why rest is, is uh, sometimes, you know, uh, what what your body, what the doctor orders uh, for sure. And so uh, what are some other things though that you found that went along with the psoriasis? Because the psoriasis is external, but did you have any brain fog with it? Did you have, any, were there any other issues along with it? Bloating? 
Yeah. So I almost find that when I start to get one issue, like you said, it's like a rainbow effect. So everything just starts to kind of come hand in hand with it. So um, I was getting, and I would say even leading up to the psoriasis outbreak, I was getting really bad problems with um, bloating with my gut, um, pain. It almost looked like I was pregnant at times when, and, and I had no, absolutely no idea what was going on. Um, and there was definitely brain fog. Um, there was times where I would get super lightheaded or have like the heart, the heart um, palpitations, like cold hands and feet all the time. Um, just, I mean, I have a, literally a list of things that I used to write down, like why is there so many things wrong with me and happening to me? Um, but there's definitely, and digestive stuff was a big part of it as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, going back to the, what referred to as the neuroendoimmune system. So your nervous system is stressed. It affects your endocrine system, your hormones, namely what you just spoke about, your adrenals and your thyroid. So you get the cold hands, the cold feet, you get the heart palpitations from the adrenaline and norepinephrine surging through your body. But, you know, you're not thinking this at the time. You're just saying, what, what's all these symptoms? You're probably feeling a little bit anxious because your heart rate sped up, probably having sleep-based issues. Um, so, and, and your body, um, like you said, is, is basically going to be a little bit more swollen, a little bit more puffy because your body is a big thing too. I, yeah, big problems with inflammation, um, always. (laughs) So something I'm still trying to get, um, under, under control, but yeah, the, the inflammation is a big part of it and feeling just like completely run down. Like my, I can feel it when my body just kind of wants to shut down. Yeah. So that's what I was going to, to, to really say though, all of these, um, markers that you have, all of these symptoms that you feel, they're, they're actually really good because your body all, I always say this, it, it always feels in a predictable way and feels F-A-I-L-S. So meaning, but we, all of our bodies act differently. So you'll know, and I spoke about this actually on a previous interview with Nick Broadhurst, a fellow Aussie, um, is his body uh, breaks down very specifically and mine breaks down in my own way. So he, he knows, and he spoke about this in his interview, I believe his, his legs start to get a little bit weak, a little bit tired, a little bit run down. For me, I start to feel the inflammation in my ear, nose, and throat, a little dryness in the back of my throat. But if you have your own tell signs, you'll know in the future, just saying, listen, if I don't want this to turn into a big, full-blown episode, I need to now do the diet, exercise, stress reduction, all of those specific things. And it's going to help you tremendously in the future as well. Yeah, I've, I'm learning that just to kind of listen to the signs my body's giving me. <laughs> and, and again, we all hope to never get there in the first place, but it happens. You know, I mean, we, we all, even to this day, every six months or so, I like to push my body a little harder than I probably know that it should. And then I'm like, oh, okay, there it is. Yep, all right, now we need to dial it back just a bit. But, you, you know, it's, it's okay, that's part of life. I always look at it as it's just part of the journey, it's part of the cycle. Exactly. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit more about we know you have psoriasis. You actually had to take some time off um, from a very public position, very public work that you're doing. How did you first go about beginning the healing process? So at that point, um, I guess I knew from, well, I knew that I didn't want to keep taking medications for one thing, because I know that anytime you see, um, you know, general practitioner um, for all kinds of things like my surgeries and anything psoriasis related, they would just give me um, medication, which I knew was just making me worse inevitably. So, um, I definitely wanted to go for the natural route and to try, um, implement all the diet fixes, which I had seen. It's the only thing that I'd seen success from with my psoriasis over the years was the diet. Um, so I, at that point, I just kind of gave myself time to sit back and relax and not stress myself out so much. Like you said, with the intense training, because in my mind, uh, the training was something that I should be doing and was, you know, kept pushing myself, but I could tell like I, my body just couldn't do the workouts I wanted to do. So I just had to listen, um, to that. And, um, you know, just, I saw something you posted the other day actually about like basically, you know, how your mind plays so much of a role in everything, um, with your body. So I was just trying to do things that made me happier, um, implement the diet changes and to help my body kind of, yeah, get better that way. And that's a great start. What was it about the diet, the diet changes that you would make that you'd start to see a little bit of the results? Obviously it didn't fix the psoriasis, but it would, it would at least palliate it a bit. What what was helpful? Well, for me, uh, that last time when it was really bad, I actually tried to a vegan diet. Um, and I will say that 
um, it, I did see within a couple of months, I would say, I did notice my skin. And I think it was a combination of all, thi- all things, you know, de-stressing my body as well. But I think um, I noticed my body started to calm down. The psoriasis started to calm. Um, I don't think necessarily like the vegan, I, uh, I do eat a little bit of meat now. So I don't think that was necessarily, um, you know, the, the way to continue on for me. But because I felt some deficiencies balances still um but i think i definitely needed to address those imbalances and i definitely cut out you know the sweets the um dairy um i cut back on the meat a lot and was vegan at that point um and just trying to focus more on like the micronutrients you know tons of um make sure i'm getting all my greens and all um basically you know all the antioxidants anything and everything i can um from you know better sources rather than eating bread or uh, pasta or whatever, anything with sugar and sweets. So cut yeah. all that out. No. And, and that makes sense. Everybody has, like, there are certain factors within gut and everybody likes to say, well, it's, it's, um, you know, the plant-based lectins or it's nuts or it's seeds, or it is eggs or dairy. And, and the truth is that we've seen it for everybody. Yes. Like, I mean, everybody has a sensitivity. Sure. It could be lectins for this person, could be grains. Some people, no issues at all. But what happens is with many people with gut permeability issues, and that's absolutely a factor with psoriasis in a hundred out of a hundred cases, there's no doubt about it. Uh, well, I shouldn't say that we'll always leave room for there to be a little bit. So we'll say 99 out of 100 that um, protein exacerbates it because if it's a protein seeping through the, uh, let's say, gut wall, partially undigested, no matter what, that's going to exacerbate immune system. So being on more of a plant-based diet or vegan-based diet, typically your protein goes down for most people, not everyone. Um, and then, and then oh, you don't have the um, exacerbation through the main food sensitivities, which certainly are dairy uh, and eggs for the most part. So it's a good place, you know, that is a good place to start. And I would say uh, for me, it was probably more so the protein because I wouldn't, other than maybe a cheat meal here and there, I wasn't really having a lot of dairy. Um, I definitely was eating eggs a lot too, but I was under that kind of mindset that I needed to have a lot of protein in my diet, especially for my training and everything. So um, I was definitely, you know, eating probably 30 grams of protein four times a day or so. Um, you know, like I was just eating a ton of protein and I thought that's kind of what I need to do for my training. So, um, it's interesting, the more I've listened to, you know, all your podcasts and all the research I've done, how, um, you hear that you don't need to have that much protein (laughs) and, um, yeah, I guess I'm just trying to learn as I go. And it's, and that's really all we are. I mean, every single day I'm reading every single day I'm researching, but the truth is that we already know so much that does work. So I always, my goal is to always help people get to a baseline, meaning be healthy, right? Like they're healthy in mind, they're healthy in their body, they're happy, which we'll call the spirit and good. So they're good to go. Now, after that, that's when we can have some fun. Like that's the icing on the cake. So for you, the goal is, okay, we need to get you hundred percent healthy, um, call it psoriasis in remission, call it that it's gone away, whatever you want to call it, but it's no longer there. Then it's saying, okay, we're going to introduce one new variable every week or two weeks. And we're going to say, do we get a positive result from this, a neutral result, or is it a negative? It actually draws you backwards. You need a couple weeks of actually introducing it. So that's the fun part. Like, I mean, I tell people that all the time, I'm always experimenting with new things, but you do have to get yourself to that level first, uh, where you're feeling good. And of course, um, that's, that's what we want to help you with and, and you're well on your way. So let's talk a little bit about, um, obviously, um, you said, okay, I really want to figure out and, and get to the bottom of this. Uh, was, what was the next step? Was the next step running the labs? I, just, I want to take you, I want to listen to your journey because I'm not working with you specifically. You're actually working with one of our, uh, amazing health coaches, uh, Julia Hayes, and, and I'm sure you're doing a lot of uh, great work on your own as well. So I'm not saying that either, but take us through more of the process now of how you're getting to the bottom of this. Yeah, so um, I definitely got my psoriasis, you know, kind of back under control. And then leading up to the last few months, um, I started working with Julia. So we first started with um, all the lab testing, um, the the big five, I think it's called. And then um, basically to get a better understanding of, you know, where the imbalances are. And uh, I guess... I've definitely had tests done it with my, with my local doctors before and they just tell me everything looks fine and good. And I knew there was more to it because I was often not feeling great and I'm and thinking, well, I should be 
you know, a healthy young woman. So something's not right still. So I'm glad, you know, I've been looking more into all that. Um, I definitely wasn't having enough, um, you know, my inflammation was a big problem for me and my digestive issues. So, um, and even, you know, hormones and imbalances like that. So we started with, um, the Dr. Cabral detox and, um, basically supplementing all the imbalances with like the omega threes that I wasn't really getting. And I don't eat any seafood actually. So I definitely needed those. Um, and you know, balancing the thyroid with thyroid support, adrenal support, um, and the B vitamins and making sure I'm getting in, you know, the, the shakes. I do those twice a day now too. So, um, yeah, just all rebalancing and, um, getting my levels up to where they should be to feel good again. And I can tell, I can feel the difference a hundred percent. That's great to hear. And then I, I think the, the big part too, is just making sure that we remove, if there's any candida, any bacterial overgrowth, any parasites or any H pylori that we're working on that because we want a clean slate in the gut. And then the, the next phase eventually will be to seal up that gut wall. And really that's when the, that's when the deeper level of healing can really begin. And the reason is that, it's almost like until you do that, even though you're doing all these great things and they're working, don't get me wrong, like you're doing so many great things in your life that are working, but you always have a couple holes and a couple leaks in the rowboat that you continue to have to bail out every single day because it's causing inflammation if you never seal up that gut wall. And, and that's part of the issue is you'll also have a lot more freedom in the future for food choices. Once it's been 10, 12 weeks of reduced inflammation and, and a sealing up of the gut wall, your body is just not as reactive anymore. And so it's, it It'll be pretty amazing. Every 12 weeks, every 12 weeks, you feel that much better. Um, and, and hopefully this is just, again, a story in the future that you look back on and, and uh, can teach others about. Yeah, well, I've actually started taking your course too, because it's something I would love to be able to help others with and something that I know that I would need help with moving forward too, to make sure I don't fall back into bad habits. Or if I um, you know, notice something going wrong, I can kind of know what it is and what I need to do to fix it. So I definitely want to... Um, be able to help myself and others moving forward too. Oh, that's fantastic. I didn't even know that. So uh, that's, yeah, that's a surprise. Good. Just started, yeah, studying the course too. You're, you're in level one, I'm assuming right level now. Level one, yeah. For IHP. Good. Good for you. That's fantastic. And then it is like, that's, uh, even though, again, we all have our own journey and I look back on it now and it's like the worst thing that ever happened to me and the best thing that ever happened to me uh, because I wouldn't be here, wouldn't be chatting with you here today if I hadn't gone through what I went through. But also I get to teach it to my daughters and obviously my parents would have loved to have taught this to me, but they didn't know it. And my grandparents didn't know it. It kind of like stopped one more generation before that. Like my great, great aunt who I actually had um, the pleasure of knowing growing up. She was um, just a, a little older than my grandmother and she knew she, she did not eat certain foods. She ate the same foods basically every single day. She was using olive oil as a moisturizer and a, like it was unbelievable uh, using the garlic and, but she came from Italy and she just knew this is how generations live. She went for a walk every day um, and really kind of lived very, very tempered and uh, she, happy, happy woman. So, you know, those are great things that I'm going to be able to teach my kids. And, and again, you'll do the same, but the thing is too, your body's going to be so much healthier and ready when you're ready to start a family. And so that's, that's kind of one of the big benefits. Yeah, exactly. That's, it's important to me. I wish I had known these things a long time ago. I wish I had the answers, but now I feel that I'm finally on like the right track. And that's something I definitely want to, I'm almost grateful that it's, you know, everything happens for a reason, I believe. And like you said, I wouldn't be who I am today without all the things I've been through. So I'm grateful for that. And the, these are things I want to learn and implement um, into my lifestyle and then to be able to pass on to hopefully my kids one day. So, um, it almost makes me excited knowing that, that, that I can have those, you know, better ways to teach them eventually, um, to be healthier. Yeah, no doubt about it. And, and are you starting to te cause you have quite a large social following online following right now. Are you beginning to share and teach and do you, are you taking people through your journey or do you feel like they don't necessarily want to go along for that part of the ride? No, I definitely, um, uh, I started this a few years ago, I would say now, um, trying to kind of bring everyone into my life outside of the wrestling because it was important for them to know who I was as a person. Mm -hmm. Um, so I definitely share, you know, all kinds of things of my health and my fitness. Um, that's why I shared my story about psoriasis and I've done a few now. Um, I have a YouTube show as well, but a, a few times where I've shared 
my story and talked about my struggles um, and ways I overcame those. Um, I talk about, you know, mental health and how important I always put up, you know, pictures of food I'm eating and, and stress the importance of um, diet and lifestyle. So, you know, I think a lot of people don't understand that it's what they're putting into their bodies is like one of the biggest parts of this whole thing into feeling good, you know, so, and it all ties back into mental health. So I try to kind of share that with everyone and hope, help them with that for sure. Yeah. With that, what, what is your YouTube show about? Cause I'm not as familiar with that. Obviously I know your Instagram account, love, obviously I love hopping on YouTube during lunchtime uh, or end of the day. So what's your YouTube show all about right now? Um, so it's called taste of Tennille. Um, and it originally started with me trying to give some just alternatives to foods people were eating and like things that I was cooking at home. And then the, over the last few years, it's more evolved or more recently evolved into, um, a show about my travels that I'm doing because I just absolutely love to travel. Um, so just kind of insight on what I'm doing when I'm traveling places I'm going, um, you know, different in different countries, um, outdoor activities and things I get up to and things I do that make me happy. And yeah, I'm just kind of sharing that with my audience too. Did I see you? I may have seen one. Did you just do one in Tulum uh, fairly recently? I did. So I, I did one in Tulum and that was a f- couple of months back now, I think. And then I went to Jamaica um, more recently. That was the latest one. Got it. Yeah. I went to Tulum for the first time. Oh, it was just a couple of years ago. And it was like the first real trip my wife and I took away from our kids. And it was, I mean, it was like our spot. Like it was, it was absolutely fantastic place. No car. You just walk everywhere, take a bike everywhere, little restaurants, beach restaurants, tons of juice places, uh, fresh food. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. That's why exactly why I love it. And right on the beach, you can't really help but be happy. And all the cenotes are beautiful too. No, they, they really are. We did, um, I remember doing a a big sauna experience. I can't think of it right now, but it's uh, basically the stone hut. It was a whole ceremony we went through and it was my wife and I, and like the master of the ceremony, they called it. It was like two and a half hours long. You start right before you start like dusk right before uh, the sun sets. And by the time you finish the moon's out, I mean, it was, it was a wild experience. It was fantastic. It really was. I'll have to share the, uh, the destination, wherever that was, uh, that I was at, but it was a traditional one that they would do and they have done for the past couple thousands of years, thousands of years. And so it's really nice to be and immerse yourself in some of the heritage and all these different locations that you go to, you know, not just saying, okay, I'm going to go to the beach and do these things like, okay, like what's going on in the local culture? What are they doing? What are they preserving? And, uh, and Tulum is a pretty special place. So that's great. Yeah. I actually got, um, a a mud, um, like a clay massage, Mm. I should say when I was there. So that was very interesting and different. That's great. Really good for the skin, detoxifying. So that's fantastic. What are the things um, that you're doing right now? Because I know that you're getting back now into uh, your wrestling career t- after some time off. So what are you taking with you uh, for your new routine, your new recovery? Of course, you have, your, you have your supplements, you have your protocols, but what else are you doing? Are you focusing on something else to make sure that you continue to improve and get healthier? Um. I mean, I'm definitely, like you said, um, taking more notice of, um, my recovery techniques. So, um, I actually bought the infrared sauna. Um, and so I've been using the, doing the dry brushing, the sauna, I'm trying to do more yoga and more recovery techniques. Um, especially when I'm on the road, I, you know, I take my little kit as well with like my, my workout bands and my slider boards and everything. So I can, even if there's not a gym around or, you know, even I've got a skipping rope as well. So even if there's not a gym, there's no excuse, you know, to do some kind of, um, exercise or activity wherever you are. Um, so I'm just trying to implement that. And, and obviously, and I, you know, I've implemented the smoothies, like I said, twice a day. So I I travel everywhere now with my little bullet and all my, uh, supplements and my, um, and I get fresh blueberry, uh, the frozen blueberries everywhere I go. So I just try to make sure there's a fridge and a, a, um, freezer where I go too, so I can bring all my stuff with me. <laughs> that That's literally the first thing that I do is if the hotel doesn't have a little refrigerator in there, then I just ask them if, if they would bring one up. And, and most hotels are very accommodating uh, because you can say it's for medical reasons and then they will bring up the little fridge and all they do is just plug it in. So it's not like it's a big deal. It's easier than people realize. And I even try to get, um, when I stay at places like an Airbnb or hotels with a kitchenette too, so I can literally go to like a Whole Foods or something by, um, good quality meat and organic vegetables and then um, make my own food as opposed to eating out. Cause it's sometimes 
hard to get what you need out. A hundred percent. Yeah. Without it. One of the first things that I do when I land too, is I just go straight to the Whole Foods because usually I'm just carrying a, a roller bag. And so I'll just go in there. I'll get whatever I need fresh. And, and a lot of times that's berries and just easy things like that. And, and then, I mean, it's really, it can be really easy to eat healthy on the go. You just have to go with a little bit of a plan. It's just, you need to know ahead of time, here's what I'm going to do. And, and like you said, if you can stay at a Marriott residence or something like that, which really doesn't cost more money, but you just have to like find them, then they have a little kitchenette. And so you have like a little couch, you've got a bed and you've got a kitchen that's like a little studio apartment and you have everything you need right there exactly so it just takes a little effort and you know where there's when there's a will there's a way is what they say so i think um you just become it just becomes part of a routine once you just set yourself up for that so you just get used to finding the right places to stay buying the right foods looking for a place like with like a local whole foods um i did exactly the same thing i just got to la went to the whole foods straight away stocked up put everything in my fridge and freezer so i can just kind of do my normal routine still and not be worried about where I'm going to find what I need and, and, and worry about going off track. hundred percent. And then your exercise, your workouts right now, um, are you doing those? I mean, what's your typical workout routine four or five days a week? Is it less than that now? What's that look like? Yeah. So I would say I probably, I probably lift about, um, four times a week, but I also, um, have more, of mobility, um, recovery training, um, as well as, um, days where I do some like hit training or, um, you know, more cardio based. Um, and even this week I'll be doing a lot of hiking. So a lot of outdoor fun stuff, you know, it doesn't necessarily seem like as much of a workout, um, but it's more enjoyable. And I'm actually extremely sore from the workout of the hike I did yesterday already. That's great. And then do you feel like you're getting the same level of workout with bands uh, than you used to with uh, heavier weights, much heavier weights, barbells, dumbbells, et cetera? I'm not as concerned as trying to like lift really heavy weights like I used to be and where I thought I needed to years ago. Um, I do definitely, um, you know, do a lot of body weight workouts, the band stuff. I actually love it. And you can get your heart rate up and do a lot, um, you know, of get a great session in doing all those things. Um, you know, sometimes I might just have a kettlebell on hand or a couple of um, dumbbells, but, you know, I'm not too concerned with, you know, using a squat rack or a bench press or things like that anymore. Um, I just kind of make do with what I have and uh, I enjoy that training anyway. So I think yeah, it's when you kind of pushed outside of your comfort zone, you find new things that you enjoy. For sure. And, and you know what, you can do those workouts more often since it's not just crushing your nervous system because a lot of people think that their workouts... Uh, the only thing that needs to recover your muscles. Well, if that were the truth, yes, you could absolutely work out uh, daily and then larger muscle groups, let's just say like every 72 hours or so. But it's really your nervous system that you're pushing to a much higher degree that needs more time to recover. And that nervous system is what we were talking about earlier, affects the hormones, which then affects the immune system, which then is the trigger for any type of genetic based you know, issues. Exactly. So I'm trying to be more aware of that and I can feel it a hundred percent when I do a, um, when I'm struggling to get through like a hard workout or something, I can tell, I just need to listen to my body. Do you share any of your workouts on social media with your followers? Um, I have here and there, but not, um, hasn't been a focus of mine. Um, but I think, uh, over the next little while I may start to, um, even just on my Instagram stories, just show like parts of my training, little circuits. Um, there's some stuff I want to share, um, in this next little while. Um, and I, you know, I, I shared my hike yesterday. It was actually kind of funny cause I accidentally went on the wrong route and it was a very adventurous <laughs> hike. Um, but yeah, I shared that with everyone too. And just kind of, like I said, um, make, just make it aware that I, you know, love doing things outdoors and being active and that ties into me being healthy and happy. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm gonna have to check that out because I know that, um, uh, we DM back and forth a little bit when I got my new Solomon hiking boots and this is a little, little shut up. I mean, it's just like, it's just these little things. I love going to Maine, love hiking some of the trails and especially, uh, New England, the leaves have turned, it's starting to fall. Like, I mean, it's just, it's really beautiful. And then you get a pair of new boots that are actually comfortable to hike in that you could easily hike 10 miles, uh, in those. Uh, and I was just like, yeah, it's the little, it's the little things that matter the most. It is the little things. And I, I say, I, I do lots of uh, little cheesy quotes and <laughs> inspirational stuff all the time on my social media, but those are things that make me happy. But I say things like little things and, you know, 
um, that all the time. And I got new hiking boots as well. So I'm going to Yosemite tomorrow. So I'll be hiking more the rest of the week. So I'm excited for that. I'll have, to ch- I'll have to check out those stories as well. That's, that is a goal of mine to get out there. Uh, some of the most beautiful uh, Yosemite's out there. Uh, and then a West further from me is, uh, I think it's Glacier National Park, Zion National Park. Like those places just look I've been incredible. wanting to go to those places too. So one day, one day I'll get out there. Hopefully all of this passes and uh, I'd love to be able, again, like I said, pass this on to my girls, just get them interested in nature, get them interested in, in doing a lot of these things as well. So I'd love to hear now, what is the new, you know, over the next year or two, what's the new plan for you? What, what, what can we look forward to seeing you doing and what are you looking forward to yourself? Well, I'm definitely going to, um, outside of wrestling, um, be focusing on my travel influencer work and um, trying to kind of get to know more brands and places that um, I guess are focused on that healthier lifestyle. Um, and, you know, like you said, like in Tulum, a lot of places are focused around yoga and things like that and like the juice places, so things like that. Um, I also, uh, am working with a new PR company, um, on bringing that all together too. And I want to just adventure more. I'm even thinking of getting like a van and doing like the whole van life mm. thing so I can just travel and see the country. Um, but also while I'm doing that, like you didn't even realize, but I'm studying, um, the IHB course. So that's, uh, obviously another goal of mine is to become certified in that and be able to start helping people with their journeys too. That's fantastic. Yeah. I think, um, I mean, doing the van life, the taste of Tennille that I'm sure that will be a hit. There's no doubt about it. Then of course you have your uh, wrestling career that will be going at least another few years. And so there's a lot, lot to follow, a lot to look forward to. Where can people follow your journey? So I'm on Twitter and Instagram. It's at Tennille Dashwood and uh, YouTube it's Taste of Tennille. Um, and I do a lot of, like I said, the Instagram stories. So the little circle up the top, you click on that on the profile. And that way you can see like my hiking adventure yesterday, for instance, um, I got like a delicious vegan curry, pumpkin curry last night that was to die for. Um, just like little things like that, that I do in like my everyday life. Um, I document on there. And even in my highlights, I save, um, basically the stories of all my trips and, um, even some of the stuff I've done with, um, with you and the programs I've been doing and the success I've had with, um, the detox and the protocols. So I keep all that on my Instagram too. That's excellent. We'll link up everything today, of course, in the show notes, uh, looking forward to sharing all that as well. Any, uh, parting words you can leave for the community. You've obviously done so much, accomplished so much, and, uh, would love for you to share just a few inspiring words with our community. Yeah, I just think it's um, very important, especially in this day and age, for all of us to uh, realize how much our own um, happiness and health is worth. Uh, Really, nothing is, you have nothing without your own health. So I think it's very important to focus on yourself. um, And uh, I definitely spend a lot of time by myself and focusing on myself. And sometimes I wonder if that is is it's too much, but at the same time, um, for me, I think it works to get myself to where I need to be. So, um, I, yeah, if, if there's anything I could share, it would be to, to do what's necessary to make sure you're happy and healthy. Hmm, that's great. That, that is, uh, words to live by for sure. Tanil, thank you so much for being on here today. We really appreciate your time and look forward to following all of your adventures coming up. <laughs> the sunlight coming through. <laughs> Beam, thank you for down having you. me. Yeah. Thank you for having me. It was awesome to talk with you. My pleasure.